He's the new kid in town, and the music's on his side. Let's dance! Footloose. Pictures presents Footloose. Will you pray with me? Oh God, you are present in every aspect of life. So you may speak to us through every gift you have given us. We pray now that your spirit will speak to us anew through words that are ancient and modern. Give them new life and new relevance for our lives as we live them in these days. In your many names we pray, amen. Well, this morning, both of the assigned lessons that you heard have to do with dancing. And so we thought that Footloose was a good movie. In the first lesson, you heard Salome dances before King Herod and uh, requests of him that he give her the head of John the Baptist. The second passage of scripture uh, talks about David bringing, uh, I'm sorry, I guess I'll reverse those. The, the, actually, the first passage of scripture talks about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant from what had been a tent in the wilderness to the city of Jerusalem. And in doing so, he made Jerusalem what it is. He made Jerusalem the holy city, the holy city for Jews, for Muslims, and for Christians. And that act of bringing the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the original scriptures, the original uh, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain, by bringing them into the city of Jerusalem and then ultimately Solomon building his great temple there. It was the act of worship that, that David at least considered the greatest act of his life. Not all the battles that he fought, you may recall, David was once, um, perhaps in his day, the greatest leader, military and political leader, alive on the planet at that moment. We don't know exactly about China, but in that part of the world, he was the most powerful man alive. But all of his, all of his battles gave him the joy that simply did the sacred act of worship, treating that only to him and his people in a way that gave it reverence and honor. It created this sort of sense of ecstasy in him. It's not surprising. You recall from reading the Psalms that David is a, uh, a musician. He calmed Saul, who was sometimes uh, emotionally and mentally demented with his playing and his singing. David, as a shepherd boy, alone at night in the wilderness, guarding the sheep, would play on his lyre and sing. And we believe that some of the psalms that we have in our scriptures today originated from David, the musician, the greatest of which, of course, is the... But in our opening hymn this morning, the words may have seemed a little oddly phrased, but they came directly from one of the psalms that David wrote, a psalm in which he invites us to dance. Because as a musician, 
David's fingers expressed his faith and his joy. His voice expressed it. And from all of the witnesses of Scripture, apparently his feet expressed it too. David filled his whole body with the presence of God and then had to find all of these ways in which to express it, to, to sing to God, to praise God with his feet with his poetry, with his very life. Now, it is sort of an interesting development story of Footloose that uh, at one point, David's writings in the Psalms becomes the, the sort of defense for, um, for restoring dancing to this uh, small town. You may not have seen the movie, or it was in 1984, um, and so you may not... I hope you did not see the remake of it, but, um, but the 1984 edition of it, um, in it, um, this young man, uh, Ren McCormick, moves from Chicago to a really, really small city. It seems to imply that the city is somewhere in Montana or something like that, but the story is actually based on a town called Elmore, Oklahoma, where that, that city banned dancing for more than a hundred years. In fact, didn't even didn't remove the van until 1980. They finally allowed the senior class to have a prom again in 1980. It just was one of those amazing things. And so, so Wren comes to this small town and he's just got to dance, but the, it's against the law. And it's mostly against the law because this Baptist preacher has made it so. I say that gently standing here in a Baptist church. But, you know, so, so it's just sort of one of those interesting things. So he decides that he's going to go to the city council and persuade them to, to revoke the ban on dancing. And, uh, and he uses the words of King David to do that. From the oldest of times, people danced for a number of reasons. They danced in prayer or so that their crops would be plentiful or so their hunt would be good. And they danced to stay physically fit and show their community spirit. And they danced to celebrate. And that, that is the dancing that we're talking about. Yeah. Aren't we told? In, in Psalm 149, praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let them praise his name in the dance. Amen. Amen. And it was King David. King David, who, who we read about in, in Samuel. And, and, and what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? David <laughs> danced before the Lord with all his might, leaping Leaping and dancing before the Lord. Leaping and dancing. And Ecclesiastes assures us that there is a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to laugh and a time to weep. A time to mourn there is a time to dance. So, I have to wonder, given the testimony of Scripture, how did the church go through an era, particularly here in the South, when dancing was considered sinful? This church in its history was once a part of, a southern, of the Southern Baptist denomination where dancing was considered immoral, unethical, sinful. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Well, I just want to suggest to you this morning that it became sinful um, for all the wrong reasons. That somehow the church, even the church, the denomination of which we once were a part, spent too much time reading Paul and not enough time reading Jesus.
And, and Paul, in fairness to him, was combating a religious movement, the, the Greeks, in his day, and said specific things to the Greeks. There are th and specific things that the Greeks could hear. The Greeks who believed that the body was sinful, the soul was sacred. Paul was trying to talk to them and speak their language. Jesus, however, was a Jew. He was born a Jew and he died. And for the Jew, the testament of Scripture begins in Genesis 1-1, where God created heaven and earth and it was good where God created humans from the stuff of the earth. And it was good. The physical stuff of life for the Jews is and always has been sacred. The work of God's hands. So the Greeks, a heresy actually, is where this idea that somehow our souls are holy, but our bodies are not. The Jews reject that. And fortunately, even today, Christians are beginning to reject that. I think the sinfulness of, of dancing really came or is rooted in and shares with our racism, our sexism, and our homophobia. Men, okay, I'm just going to say this out loud, even in church. Men, particularly men dressed in robes like me in the Middle Ages, were terrified of women's bodies. And, and so, therefore, the, the dancing, like you, women might lose control, men could do to have dancing. We never knew what women were going to do. And so, so it was out of that sexism that this anti-dance uh, sort of uh, theology came. It was homophobia. Men dancing might look like women who dance, not men. It wasn't the macho thing to do. It was racist. In this country, notice it was almost all the white conservative southern denominations that banned dancing because they saw in the churches of our African and mother American sisters and brothers a physical expression of the worship of God that I think mirrors perfectly what we have in the Old Testament and in King David, but somehow that was other and white southern denominations would have none of it. So I call upon you and I to rethink completely, not just dancing, but what it represents and how the resistance to it has come from a point of brokenness and evil and misunderstanding from sexism and racism and homophobia. We must resist that. And so there are times in our lives when we just have to dance. Now, like me, you may be uncoordinated, and the best you can do is tap your feet. It's a form of dance, and it's okay to do it in church. And not only is it okay, it is required. It is commanded. We are called upon to let go of some of the ambitions and to begin to worship God with our whole being our spirit, our souls, our minds, yes, and our strength. What the movie Footloose says to us is dance becomes this metaphor for his life. His father is gone from their life to fix it and could not. They have to leave their home and move to a place that is foreign to him and where he feels out of place. And so all that is broken in his life comes to be represented by his need to dance. Dancing is a metaphor for much of our lives. I think it's a metaphor for recovering life. So, so let me ask you, where did the exuberance of your life go? What happened to it? The exuberance, so we have a baby over here playing with a piece of paper. You once did that. Where did it go? Where did the joy of life that you took just from being able to wave a bulletin while a preacher is boring, where did that go? 
flews it. How did it slip out of our lives? The exuberance with which we were created, and more importantly for my purposes at least, where did it go from our faith? How did our joy seep out of worship on Sunday morning and become ritual and stay? How did the church become a place where you wouldn't think to, to laugh or to clap or to cry or to feel in the depth of your bones the presence of the holy? Where did it go? And how do we recover it? Well, I think one of the answers about where it went is represented in Salome's story. It is a brutal story. I was think as I was working in the sermon, I thought, thank goodness the children, will, the youth will be out of the room because it is this horribly brutal story. And, and notice wow, that Salome dances, but her dance is a different kind of dance than David. Her dance, her enthusiasm, her exuberance, it's, it is solicitous. It is manipulative. It is exploitive. She is using it to get something. And worse of all, she doesn't even get the something that she might need or want out of it. She's getting out of it the bitterness and the vengeful and the anger of her mother who wants to get rid of John the Baptist because John is timidity to point out that what she is doing is wrong. And so rather than repent and deal with that, she wants to eliminate from her life the one who dared to accuse her. And, and Salome uses her dance to do that. In our modern day, expressions of Salome, they, most of which are, bo are actually not uh, based on the Bible, but based on Oscar Wilde's play. Salome does this dance of the seven veils. And it's not in the Bible, I'll just tell you that. But it is this sort of seductive thing by which she manipulates someone. And she's using it because she inherited from her mother something that was bitter and evil and angry. I think that when we ask where our dance went, we all probably have to admit a little bit that some of us have inherited some stuff that isn't always healthy. Some prejudices, some anger, some inhibition, some fear. And if we're going to recover our dance, we have to first say no to those things. We have to ask the questions, the question, whose dance are we dancing? Now at the end of the dance, Herod, the king, says, ask me what you want. I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. Now imagine that. Imagine that in your own life. You find this genie lamp and you get one wish. What would you wish for? Now, this is not a rhetorical question. I really want you to think for just a second. What would you wish for? You find this genie's lamp in your um, uh, house this afternoon, in your garage, and you rub it, and this genie comes out and says, I'll give you one wish. What will you wish for? Will you wish for money? Will you wish for a better house, a better job, a wish to be able to retire? Or will you wish for 10 more minutes? with someone who has died so you can tell them what you never got to say? Would you wish for the end of homelessness for all the people in our city that we care for who are living under bridges? Would you wish for an end of, of racism so that so much of the violence in our world could come to an end? Would you wish for a cure for AIDS? What would you wish for? It speaks the truth about what is really in your soul, about what you really value. And she asked for the head of John the Baptist. Would you ask for the punishment of your enemy? David 
perhaps can teach us how to recover our exuberance. If somebody can, can help us see where we've lost it and how we've lost it, maybe David can teach us how to recover our exuberance. I love that passage of Scripture. It says that David danced with all his might. I think the King James Version says with all his strength which reflects that love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We liberals have gotten the mind part down just fine. What about the soul and, and our spirit and our, our strength? David danced with all his might. King David danced with all his might. The most powerful person in it, perhaps, at that time. One of the wealthiest people. He had position. He had power. He had wealth. And you know what usually comes with those things? An overwhelming compunction to live according to others' expectations. I know that. I've spent 40 years as a pastor, and I can't tell you how often that has come into my mind of what people expect a pastor to do or not to do. And you and I, those expectations, the pyramid, he's got more than anyone else. He dances with all his might, despite the fact that in the corner of this painting, his wife, Michael, the daughter of King Saul, his predecessor, looks out and as he dances in this ephod, it just comes off and soon he is dancing naked before God and she despises him. But David doesn't dance to her music. He isn't doing her dance. He's doing Saul's dance. He isn't even doing the dance of all the people and their expectations of their king. He is doing God. He's being who he is, totally exposed, physically exposed, literally exposed, but in every other way, making himself vulnerable before God. He is dancing with his whole being. You know, this, some, oh, the, the church is sort of in this financial gap right now, about a three-month financial gap, where our preschool has moved out and the new one hasn't moved in. And so it really is a very difficult time. And, and so I've spent this week just sort of worrying about that, how we're going to make it through this gap. And, um, and so for a couple of nights this week, I actually literally couldn't sleep. I just was so worried about it and, and other stuff going on in our lives. And, 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 and so every, and I, this is true. All night, I always start praying for you. It's just what I do. It's what I've always done. Helping me so, um, so I mean, I just wake up right here. And, and one night this week, I woke up, and instead of uh, praying about our know, challenges and things like that, I just started being grateful. Grateful for all the blessings that are already around us. Grateful for me. Just thanking God that God has taken care of me all these years. Taking care of the Virginia High Church, and will continue to do so. So I don't need to persuade God to care for you. It will happen. It has happened. And it will continue to happen. That may be how David was able to dance with all his mind. He was able to stop dancing everyone else's dance and simply dance. I think that if we could remember we are God's people, we could dance again too. Of course, St. Paul says, if you live, you live to the Lord. And if you die, you die to the Lord. Whether you live or you die, you are the Lord. And if you could believe that and trust that, you could dance through all your life. Despite the circumstances, despite the challenges you've had in the past and the challenges you will face in the future, in this present moment, dance. Because it is never too late to have the 